Hello, everyone, and welcome to Headwise, the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, founder of Migraine Nation and chronic daily migraine survivor. I'm excited to tell you I'm here today with someone new who we have not had on our podcast or webcast before. I'm here with Dr. Shivang Joshi. Hi, Dr. Dr. Joshi. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Um, Dr. Joshi is the Director of Headache Medicine at the Community Neuroscience Services in Westboro, Massachusetts. I love talking to D Dr. Joshi. He is so knowledgeable. There's so many things he knows, and I ask him a lot of questions about the details behind certain things. And when I was talking to him about COVID and headache and the headache that people are reporting post-COVID, he knew so many things, and he had just given a talk on it, and I want to make sure he can share all this with you guys. I think you're all going to be so interested. So that is our topic today, post-COVID or long COVID and headache. So Dr. Joshi, can you start by telling the audience a little bit about yourself and why you work in headache medicine? Sure. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a pharmacist as well as a neurologist. I did my headache uh, residency in New York City and then went on to do my headache fellowship in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from uh, my day-to-day -day of clinical practice of headache medicine, I also teach at the pharmacy school. I'm very active with that. And I'm also very active with the American Headache Society um, and currently the chair of the pharmacology and therapeutics section. Uh, so I, I love headache medicine because it's one of those fields where uh, I can use all my background, right? So pharmacology involves treatment, whether it's acute treatment, prevention. Um, I also forgot to mention I have a master's in public health, which really mm -hmm. emphasizes sort of a preventative aspect from a population base. And I really felt when I did my headache elective in neurology, actually did it with uh, Dr. Lipton and Dr. Larry Newman in New York City. And um, I was able to really see the patient population and um, felt that my background and um, you know the way we were approaching headache medicine was evolving over time in terms of research, therapeutics available, that I thought I could really uh, make a difference in patients' lives. Okay. Um, so your background is so interesting and it's why I feel when I talk to you, I get a very different perspective on the uh, thoughts and questions I have when it comes to migraine and headache and especially this whole idea around COVID and people being diagnosed with new daily persistent headache. Uh, when they develop a COVID-19 infection. And I really wanted to speak to those people today. So first of all, I'm sure we have a lot of people listening who experienced either a new headache disorder or a worsening of their previous headache disorder after a COVID-19 infection, or maybe someone in their family uh, had this issue. So let's begin with some terminology. For the most part, if it, you develop a new headache disorder uh, post-COVID, is it being categorized as NDPH? You know, it's an interesting question. I think that when you look at the definition of NDPH and you, and you uh, in a simplistic term, you know, it's a headache that starts on a specific day and it's continuous since then. It does have several variations of the definition which allow for uh, persistence or remittance, but it, it, it can be that. And I think mm -hmm. uh, there's a time period that's required for it to be that. Um, and you daily persistent headache is not a specific headache. It's it's a way to categorize the way the headaches are presenting in that patient. Uh, what we like to say is that what is the phenotype of a new daily persistent headache, which means what does it look like? Right. And so the phenotype can be a tension type headache or the phenotype can be a migraine type of headache. So um, certainly when a headache that a person has after having COVID reaches a certain time frame, approximately three months, and it's uh, without any break in between, we would call it a new daily persistent headache uh, for that patient. Uh, even if they've had a previous history of uh, headaches, but not as frequent or not as uh, similar. So um, I think it would be it would be good to um, refer it as new daily persistent headache when it meets those criteria. Okay, so let's talk about the group of people out there who already had a history of migraine or another headache disorder. Then they develop COVID, and it gets worse. 
Um, are they more likely, because they had a history of a headache disorder, to have a worsened headache disorder post-COVID than someone who didn't have a history of headache? Or are we all uh, equally as likely to develop uh, chronic headache post-COVID? Those are very good questions. So um, yes, the answer is yes. Migraine patients who have a pre previous history of migraine after they develop COVID tend to have an exacerbation or more worsening of their symptoms. Now, there have also been reports of patients who've never had any kind of migraines or tension type headaches who wind up developing those uh, migraine-like symptoms and migraines and tension type headache after COVID without a history. So you can certainly develop it without having a history, but having a history uh, does predispose you to developing uh, more intense and, and more, I guess, frequent migraines. And if you think about it, you know, the migraine patient, you know, migraine is a neurological disorder, mm -hmm. and this is how we like to refer to it now. And the migraine brain is just different, right? If you look at some of the symptoms in migraine patients, the hyperacusia, the sensitivity to light, noise, and smell, it's just a very, the brain is a very hyperexcitable state. So when For you introduce- our patients, can you define hyperacusia really quick? Sure. Mm -hmm. Hyperacusia is just uh, sound sensitivity. Okay. or uh, uh, phonophobia. Okay. So um, what that means is that all putting all those all those things together, your brain is just hyper excitable and hypersensitized. Mm -hmm. Now when you add into the mix a viral episode, um, mm -hmm. the pathophysiology that's involved there is going to just exacerbate that. Right. So you may not we may not know this, but uh, I think a lot of people are curious. For those of us who already have a headache disorder, uh, before we develop a COVID infection, these these uh, post-COVID headache uh, issues that people are having, is it sort of their same headache that they're feeling, or are they getting something entirely, does it feel different to them? So for the most part, they're exacerbations of their existing headaches, mm -hmm. but there are other features. So, uh, you know, what was interesting was when all this, this was happening, um, I was actually in practice. I was continuing to see patients uh, in the office versus virtually. So we were able mm -hmm. to do that, you know, using the appropriate uh, screening methods. Right. And one of the things I noticed in my practice was a lot of patients were presenting with myofascial, occipital, cervical pain in addition to their migraine exacerbation. But the prominent feature that they were presenting with was sort of a, a myofascial, uh, occipital neuralgia uh, type of picture. And and I started documenting this and noticed this in almost 75% of the patients in over 200 cases that I collected over that period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and also in talking to my colleagues throughout the country, they also had noticed that there was this sort of myofascial cervical, uh, cervicalgia uh, component in addition to their migraine symptoms that they were presenting with, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now at the time of this recording, um, do we currently have an actual clinical definition for long COVID? That's a very good question. So uh, who would you like for me to quote? So the CDC, <laughs> the World Health Organization, uh, the National Health Services, or the National Institutes of Health Care uh, Excellence. So they all have different definitions. I'll give okay. you two. So the CDC's definition of long COVID uh, is wide range of new returning or ongoing health problems people can experience four or more weeks after the first after first being infected with the virus that causes COVID-19. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, this is again 2021, illness that occurs in people who have a history of probable or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, mm -hmm. usually within three months from the onset of COVID-19, with symptoms and effects that last for at least two months that cannot be explained by an alternative diagnosis. Okay. Uh, and National Health Services. I'll give you one more. It's very simple. This one says symptoms lasting weeks or months after the infection has gone. Okay. So, so at there least you go. <laughs> it's recognized. It's rec It's not something that, you know, they're telling they're telling people that they're nuts and it's all in their head. It's recognized. It's not, it's not a conspiracy. Yes. We know it exists. <laughs> okay. So that is, that is a relief in and of itself. Um, so we're going to get into some interesting details of how and why headache, migraine, and other neurological symptoms can be triggered by this virus. Um, because that in and of itself, I think is very interesting. But first, let's get to the question everyone wants an answer to, which is, is it going to go away? 
is this this new headache or any of these other symptoms that some people are being stuck with for a very long time after their COVID infection, is it going to go away or do we know yet? You know, there I cannot definitively say it's going to go away 100%. Um, but there was a study published recently uh, in JAMA, and it was, uh, I believe, in the UK, that over 4,000 patients and um, there were about 13% of the patients who had symptomatic and persistent symptoms at one month, mm -hmm. and then about 4.5% of the patients at month two. So what you are seeing as, as the months go on, you're seeing less and less number of patients that are persistent with their symptoms. Okay. Uh, now, however, um, we're, we're only looking at certain regions. We don't have a, a, you know enough information. There are so many people that were impacted by COVID-19 that I bet you that number would change uh, based on surveillance, right? So mm -hmm. there probably is not enough research out there trying to surveil if people actually have long COVID or not. Remember, mm -hmm. long COVID doesn't always present with just headaches. There's longstanding uh, anxiety, mood-related issues, myalgia, fatigue. So there are a lot of other symptoms that are related to this that someone may be walking around not attributing it to COVID uh, mm -hmm. and just thinking it's something else. So I think that there's a lot more research in terms of uh, epidemiology that needs to be done, though. Okay. All right. Um, so I think it can be difficult for some people to understand why um, a virus that we associate with harming us through our lungs can also affect our nervous system. So uh, can you talk to us about how and why this virus is affecting our nervous system? Because that could, it's interesting and it can be a jump for some of us to understand. Right, absolutely. So, um, you know, the SARS-2 COVID, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is about 20, 10 to 20 times more binding affinity for uh, the ACE2 receptor. So this is how it gains entry into our system, right? Uh, right? ACE2 receptor is found in neurons as well as lung tissue, right? But the primary route of any, um, uh, you know, environmental uh, sort of entry point is usually through respiratory avenues, right? So through mm -hmm. our lungs, through our nasal passages. And both of these areas contain ACE2 receptors. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very common for uh, viruses to use that as an entry point and what's unique about the SARS-CoV-2 is that it actually has a, uh, a spike protein, and the spike protein is what allows it to fuse with uh, the cells in the body, and then it then incorporates its uh, viral uh, genetic material into the host cell. Um, uh, so, you know, how does it then get into the central nervous system? Well, part of that has to do with what happens with SARS-CoV-2 is that it kind of suppresses your body's reactions. For a while, your body's not aware of what's going on. Your immune system is not tipped off. Mm -hmm. During this time, what the virus does is spreads, okay? Mm -hmm. As it's spreading, um, it's it's causing an inflammatory reaction. Um, so there's, there, there's many ways that the virus can cause uh, entry into the central nervous system. And I think uh, you're gonna ask me about neurotropism. Yeah. Uh, and- <laughs> You read my mind. <laughs> So uh, because of its higher binding affinity, uh, there's a couple of ways that it can gain into the uh, nervous system, right? So neurotropism basically means, in a simplistic form, entry into the central nervous system. Uh, so there's the olfactory route, which is through the nasal passageway as well. Uh, there are connections from the uh, trigeminal nerve terminal branches in the nasal passages that go through the olfactory system. And then there's a connection into the central nervous system as well. But also um, just entry by blood-brain barrier, right? So when the virus is floating around in your circulatory system, uh, you know, this the, obviously our, our blood circulates in the brain as well too, but there are areas that are weak sometimes. Uh, there are areas that uh, during uh, an infection that are more open to entry. So the virus can then gain entry into the central nervous system through these sort of gaps, but it doesn't necessarily have to get into the central nervous system to wreak havoc. What it can do is it can cause inflammation around that area, and then this can do more damage as well, too. So okay. uh, these are the entry. This is what neurotropism uh, is referring to. Neurotropism basically means that it is able to enter our nervous system. Correct. 
Okay. And, and this is because um, our nervous system has the receptor that the SARS-CoV-2 virus binds to. Right. And in fact, the, the choroid plexus in that area is, uh, is very rich in ACE2 receptors. So there are parts of the blood-brain barrier that are exceptionally rich in these receptors and the virus attaches to that. Okay. So you mentioned neuroinflammation. Now, neuroinflammation um, is part, I believe, of what we are blaming for the cause of migraine and headache uh, related to COVID. Um, is that true? Right. And we have such a better understanding of migraine pathophysiology now than we ever did before, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that calcitonin gemulated peptide plays a role. Uh, which is a potent vasodilator, but also there's a neuroinflammatory pathway too, which involves cytokine, substance P, other pro-inflammatory agents. In fact, there are medications approved for treating migraines that work on inflammation, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so there, there is a mechanism in migraines that involves neuroinflammation. Okay. Now, with regards to uh, neuroinflammation and viruses, what happens is that uh, this infection uh, you know, the, the, the virus infiltrates several different parts of the body that are responsible for our immunity, such as macrophages or minus, uh, monocytes. And a lot of these are components of the blood-brain barrier. And what happens is uh, when they gain entry, this causes a pro-inflammatory cytokine reaction, mm -hmm. uh, which is just uh, imagine uh, just, you know, something wreaking havoc and releasing all these chemicals that uh, are pro-inflammatory. And a lot of the inflammatory component subsequently can lead to uh, fibrosis. It can lead to clots or thrombosis. Uh, some examples of um, things that are inflammatory include cytokines such as uh, tumor necrosis factor. Mm -hmm. uh, you have other chemokines which such as CCL5 and other ones. And, and what they do is they also attract other T cells which are involved in the immune inflammatory response. Okay, so my question is, so now we know that this inflammatory response happens and it can cause us to have migraine, more migraine, uh, when we the virus enters our body, when the virus is uh, causing problems in our body. Is this inflammation process part of migraine normally? Right, so we do think that inflammation also plays a role in migraines as well. Okay. Because one of the other things that happens is that when when calcitonin gemulated peptide is released at the nerve terminal ending, not only um, does it um, cause migraines by inducing nerve signal transmission of pain, but it mm -hmm. also causes vasodilation, releasing other inflammatory mediators, okay. uh, nitric oxide, substance P, substance P. So yes, inf the inflammatory component is a part of migraine as well too. Okay, so this happens when we have the infection. And do we know why it doesn't go away for those people that have a post COVID headache that doesn't go away? You know, I think that it'd be nice to, to have a sort of a biomarker. Um, I don't think we're there yet in knowing why some people have a longer version versus some people have a shorter duration. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, I would speculate and say that if they have significant other comorbid conditions, uh, that they uh, may more, you know, they are more likely to have a longer persistent component. Or uh, if an individual's response to the SARS-CoV-2 virus was a robust inflammatory, you know, inflammatory response, mm -hmm. um, you know, did that create a scenario where there was more damage done in that in that per individual person versus someone else? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if someone develops NDPH or a worsening of their previous headache disorder after being infected or after a COVID-19 infection, how long should they wait before seeking help from a headache specialist? Meaning if they are sitting at home right now thinking it's going to get better uh, and it hasn't, how long do you think they should, you know, wait like that, wait in pain uh, before they finally decide to go see someone about this headache? Right. You know, I think that it's important not to wait. I think it's important to see someone as soon as possible. And the reason is because there's still a lot we don't know about what SARS-CoV-2 uh, is capable of doing. 
Yeah. And the reason why I say this is because uh, if you have something that's new and different, that in itself is a change in quality and character of your headaches, right? Mm -hmm. So when there's a change in quality and character of your headaches, depending, you know, whether it's quality of character or change in frequency, that belongs to one of the red flags of when you should be seen by a specialist uh, or even primary, just wherever you can at least get your foot somewhere, whether it's primary care, who can then refer you to a neurologist. But uh, it, it's one of the indications for obtaining uh, MRI imaging of the brain, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I say this is because uh, there have been cases of thrombosis, of strokes, uh, of vascular related things that have occurred. Uh, you know, poster, there's a, a condition called press syndrome, which is just uh, swelling and inflammation behind the head and the brain. Uh, mm -hmm. There have been cases of strokes, ischemic strokes. So, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's better to uh, see someone as soon as possible, as soon as okay. there's been a change in quality or character of your headaches. Okay. That so would be for... regardless, right? So if there's, even if it's not related to a viral infection, right. uh, that criteria is one of the red flags for obtaining further imaging. Okay. So for people who were taking um, migraine medicines, et cetera, for previous migraine, can, should they, can they continue to take their migraine medicines for a worsening migraine disorder post COVID? Does, does it make sense to continue with their, their treatment plan? I think for the most part, it does make sense to continue. And, you know, it might take a little bit more for, for, you know, their headaches to respond uh, mm -hmm. because this is basically a, no pun intended, but a headache on steroids. <laughs> uh, so uh, some patients may require steroids, but I think okay. if, if it's something very severe and debilitating and you're, ha right. you're having active neurological issues uh, that may indicate there's a stroke or a clot mm -hmm. or something like that, in that scenario, I would recommend you you get yourself checked out more urgently, um, okay. and, and not uh, you know expect your medication to be working in those scenarios. Okay. So, is there anything uh, else you'd like to add to our discussion of post COVID headache? I think it's important to know that um, you know if you're patients out there that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. There are many people that are going through this. And there are a lot of smart people that are working on answers, doing research, but, you know, don't be afraid to bring it up to your provider. It's not a sign of weakness, right? I think it's important that your provider know that you have headaches, um, whether you think you have had COVID or not have COVID, you know, you may have had COVID and not known. Mm -hmm. So certainly you don't hesitate to, to have that conversation. The other okay. aspect is the psychosocial aspect of this, right? So headache just doesn't come by itself. There's anxiety, depression, there's other areas that may be affected. And, uh, you know, you should seek help for those as well, too. Right. And there's so many people have fatigue. Um, so don't be hard on yourself. Uh, this can be rough. You might not feel good. And and don't worry about going and, and asking, asking for help, going and seeing, going and seeing someone, go to see your doctor, go to get a different treatment plan if it's needed, if you're doing much worse. So I think that's the bottom line is uh, don't worry about going back and, and asking um, for help if you're feeling really bad, even though the infection, the COVID infection may have cleared up. So uh, anything else? Uh, thank you so much, you're welcome. Dr. Joshi. That was actually a very informative and an awesome episode. I hope that uh, everyone got something that was interesting to them. Um, feel free to comment or ask questions. And I hope everyone is having an awesome day. Uh, please join us again next week on the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. <laughs>